Stanford University. I'd like to tell you about nanotechnology, small science with a big future. Being asked to give an overview of nanotechnology is a little bit like being asked to give an overview of technology. There's so many different areas that it touches on. And so my goal by the end of the talk is that you would basically understand why there are so many different areas of science and engineering where nanotechnology and nanoscience are relevant, as well as having some sense of the kind of breakthroughs that people are making and hoping to make uh, using the fantastic advances in modern nanotechnology that have come along. Actually, this picture isn't just a picture of a part of the quad. This is also an illustration of some of the ways that nanoscience and nanostructures have always been present in our everyday lives. Um, this is a rainbow. Rainbows diffract because the light in the rainbow interacts with uh, water particles in a particular way. And the wavelength of visible light is actually hundreds of nanometers. This is also a picture that includes uh, clouds that have a number of steam particles in them, where there's a lot of really interesting things going on with the way that water tends to clump together. It's got trees. Trees are amazing nanotechnology, amazing biologically developed nanotechnology. The way that cells grow and that photosynthesis happens is really beautiful. So to a certain extent, nanotechnology and nanoscience is just using a modern word to describe processes that have always been present. And what's new now is that we have ways of seeing things and understanding things and manipulating things that weren't available to us previously. So let me start by talking about what is nanotechnology. Um, the word nano comes from the Latin nanus, meaning dwarf. It's formally used as a prefix to indicate unit multiplication by 10 to the minus 9. And in the case of using that prefix with meter, the length scale of a nanometer uh, is a very important length scale. And so the informal use of nano has become a catchword to indicate a shorthand for all kinds of nanoscience, nanotechnology, and nanoengineering. And in fact, it's not unfortunately that uncommon to sit in a committee talking about, well, should we call this nanotechnology, or should we call this nanoengineering, or should we call this nanoscience? We just say nano most of the times. So as I said, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And nanoscale science and engineering means the study and control of matter on an atomic and molecular scale with structures and parts that are about 100 nanometer or smaller. Let me try to give you a sense for what a nanometer is. Suppose that you had a scale bar that indicated how big a nanometer is. And you wanted to scale it up 100 million times. So you want to scale that bar up by 10 to the 8. What kind of structure do you think that you would get? You would get a baseball. Now suppose that you want to take a baseball and scale a baseball up by 100 million times. You would get the whole Earth. So a nanometer is as much smaller as our everyday lives than the things, the objects that we hold in our everyday lives is compared to the Earth. So let me ask you how big an atom is. This is a picture of an atom that's often used to indicate modern physics for reasons that somewhat escape me. Um, but uh, an atom is something that has a nucleus and it has electrons that orbit in the nucleus, although they do it quantum mechanically and not in the classical fashion shown here. So how big is an atom? It's a fraction of a nanometer. A row of something like 1 to 10 atoms will be about a nanometer long. Now, actually, the question of exactly how big is an atom is a somewhat difficult question to answer. You have to answer what you mean by the size of the atom, because an atom, unlike a baseball, is not something that has usually a sharp boundary. It's something that has an electron cloud around it. And that cloud can um, distort and shrink and grow in response to its environment. So the exact size of an atom depends not only on what elements it is, but also on what its local environment is. Um, why don't I like this picture of the atom? which looks somewhat like a planetary system. Um, I don't like it because it's not what atoms really look like. I'm going to say a few, little bit more about the question of what do things uh, really look like. But this is a classical view of the atom, again, shown over here. And it's in really, you see it all the time to indicate modern physics or quantum mechanical physics. This particular picture that I'm showing you is from The Economist in um, April 1st, 2004. They had a wonderful article on quantum information technology and on how scientists are learning how to manipulate quantum mechanics in ways that we haven't before that could potentially give us huge speed ups in computation and information technology. And so they show this you know, poorly shaven man um, sweating because he's trying not to disturb this atom that he's balancing on the tip of his finger. So this is sort of the classic, uh, a very typical example of an article about really modern physics. But if you actually consider what does an atom look like quantum mechanically, the electrons don't move in classical circular orbits like that. The electrons have a wave-like nature. 
They're distributed um, throughout the region around the nucleus, and they have different shapes, which we call orbitals. So the density of dots in this image here indicates what's the probability of finding an electron in a given orbital at a given distance from the nucleus. And so this concept of a probability distribution, where the probability of finding the electron is distributed throughout space in a way that's described by a wave function in Schrodinger's equation, um, is, is, is really central to our understanding of what things look like at these small size scales. Another thing that makes it hard to answer the question, what do atoms really look like, is the fact that we can't really see them. Uh, when we look with our eyes, we're detecting visible light. Our eyes are basically detectors of visible light. And detecting visible light is incredibly important scientifically and technologically, not only in our everyday lives. Uh, this is the first optical microscope in 1673. It was a small glass sphere, about uh, 0.040 millimeters or 40 microns or 40,000 nanometers in size. And it acted as a lens, and it was used to discover bacteria and blood cells and really revolutionize our understanding of the micro world. Um, this is a modern optical microscope. It's much more complicated, much more expensive, but it remains one of the most important tools to characterize materials, whether they're dead materials or alive materials. Optical microscopes continue to be incredibly important. But there's a limit to what they can do, and that's because of what light is. So if you look at what light is, light is actually an electromagnetic wave. Um, there's an electric field that oscillates and a magnetic field that oscillates, and these two move together as one electromagnetic wave that propagates in a particular direction. Um, and so the light travels from the object that we're seeing to our eye or from an object that's being looked at under a microscope through a lens to a detector, whether it's an RI or a CCD camera. Um, the wavelength of visible light, this is, so light is just this electromagnetic wave, and so it can have any wavelength at all. It can have wavelengths ranging all the way from 10 to the fourth meters, which would give you uh, radio stations, all the way down to 10 to the minus 14 meters, which would give you gamma rays. Invisible light is this very narrow range of the electromagnetic spectrum where the wavelength ranges from a little less than 400 to a little more than 700 nanometers. So the wavelength of light is actually pretty big on the nanoscale. Um, and it turns out that because of the wave-like nature of light, light can't be focused to a spot that's smaller than the wavelength. So when you make an image with light, anything that's smaller than the wavelength is much too blurry to resolve the details. So in that sense, you can't see the nanoscale with your eyes. We never have been able to, and we never will be able to. What we do instead is we use um, very expensive instruments uh, that need to be housed in very expensive facilities um, in order to make electron beams and ion beams and things that have smaller natural wavelengths so they don't have this limitation. We also sometimes use x-rays which is light that has a much smaller wavelength than visible light. And then we use these to interact with the thing or the material that we want to see, and then we use a computer to make an image that lets us feel like we understand and intuit what it is that's been imaged by this more advanced technology. And that's a really important thing to keep in mind because there's no such thing as a photograph anymore at the nanoscale. So when you're reading articles about nanotechnology and you see pictures or images, sometimes they're artist conception and sometimes they're data, but even when they're data, they're data that has been at least somewhat manipulated in order to look like something that makes sense to people. Usually in a quantitative, well-defined way, but not always, and a lot of times that information is lost by the time it reaches the public media. Um, we actually have a number of discussions about the ethics of processing what we call nanoscale images in order to bring up different features that people want to see. It's an important topic in the scientific community right now. Okay. So the scale of things. Let's go back to this question of the nanometer down here. So this is a scale bar that's on a log scale. So there's a nanometer, um, which is 10 to the minus 9 meters, all the way up to a centimeter, which is 10 to the minus 2 meters. And so the baseball would be a little bit higher than that. And this is a million nanometers, which is one millimeter on that scale. This is a set of natural things that you might be familiar with and roughly where they sit on that scale. Ants are about five millimeters big. Dust mites are about 200 microns. Human hairs are 60 uh, microns wide or so. Red blood cells are seven to eight microns. Viruses are about 40 nanometers. ATP synthase is a really important biomolecule that's about 10 nanometers. DNA is even smaller than that. And individual atoms in this particular image, this is an image of silicon atoms that have a spacing of uh, just a fraction of a nanometer. There's also a number of man-made things that can be put on this scale. The head of a pin is one to two millimeters. Um, we usually think of the head of a pin as being pretty small, but it's actually pretty big on this scale. 
Um, modern microelectromechanical devices are actually um, 10 to 100 microns wide. You can make them much smaller, but if you make them smaller, you don't call them microelectromechanical devices anymore. You call them nanoelectromechanical devices, NEMs instead of MEMS. Um, here's a picture I'll show you again later in the talk where people are manipulating individual atoms. And there are also things that can be not fabricated but synthesized, like carbon nanotubes and carbon buckyballs. And this indicates the molecular structure of those kinds of things. OK, so this was billed as a class without a quiz. Um, but I'm a teacher. And <laughs> I like to check that people are understanding things. Um, so I'd like to give you a little quiz. So here's the first question. Can you resolve, don't answer, don't yell out the answer. Don't tell your friend the answer. Can you resolve one nanometer details with a really good optical microscope using visible light? Now, if this were physics 61, you would all have clickers, and I could pull you to make sure that you've been paying attention and understood what I said so far. Um, but uh, since, I, since it's not, you can't. So just put your hand here. Don't hold it up in the air. And either show one, two, or three fingers to indicate what you think the answer is. And no looking around at whoever you think is the smartest person in the class to see what they think. <laughs> Um, if you don't know, it's totally fine to say three. I just want to know where everybody is. One, two, or three fingers. OK, excellent. Um, so actually, everybody take one minute and convince whoever you're sitting next to that your answer is the correct answer, because there was some distribution of answers in the group there. <laughs> <laughs> OK, great. I hear the discussion is settling down a little bit, so let me pull the class again. What do you think? One, two, or three? Oh, I see a number of very confident twos now. OK, good. Yes. <laughs> um, all right, let's go on to the next question. About what wavelength of light would you need to resolve the structure of biomolecules? If you, and you can use seven, oh, right, nobody has seven fingers. Um, <laughs> you have two hands, right, right. You can use two, two hands like this. <laughs> this is a trickier one. This is a trickier one. OK, if this were a real class, I wouldn't let you guys talk to each other, because I want to know what you think individually before I let you do uh, peer instruction. But since it's not, and I can see people really want to talk, take one minute to convince whoever you're sitting next to that your answer is the right answer. I always see, already see a broad distribution of answers there. OK, great. So what, what do you think now? Let's take another poll. What do people think the answer is? OK, a number of very assertive fours and a few sixes. Hmm. OK, so actually, let's have a class discussion of that. Who's willing to explain the motivation behind their answer? <laughs> yes? The biological molecules may be thousands of atoms long. Uh -huh. So the argument was that the, um, stru the structure of a biomolecule could be thousands of atoms long, and so you're going to need to move beyond the nanometer scale into the larger than nanometer scale, maybe even the, uh, well, more than nanometer anyway. So that puts you into none. And so I think that, that reasoning is right that a bio biomolecule can be very large, um, but actually most biomolecules are in the smaller range. And also the other um, point that I would want to make about that is that you can, you can resolve objects that are larger than the wavelength of light that you're looking to. I think that you understand that. And so you could, in principle, if you're doing something that's barely resolution limited of a 100 nanometer object, use, say, 10 nanometer light to do something like that. And that would put you in that intermediate range. Would anybody like to offer a different um, point of view? 
Yes. Is there such a thing as ten hands in your life? I mean, yeah. Yes, yes. So we're not talking about visible light. That's right, we're talking about electromagnetic radiation. So the word light is used as a colloquial term to describe the full range of electromagnetic radiation, no matter how small or large the light is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yes, one more. I was just say that I think I go with nanometer. Uh huh. Because you can see objects with much smaller wavelengths, you can still. Visualize the object, and a perfect example would be the baseball you can see with visible light, with, whose wavelength is much smaller than the baseball itself. Right, yeah, that, that's actually, so I agree with you. That's the point that I was thinking of, which is that you can visualize larger objects, so you can see the baseball, he said, which is 10 centimeters approximately, with much smaller light, light that has 500 nanometers or so wavelength, like visible light usually does. I agree with that. But I also agree with the refinement on the point that the gentleman in the second row made, um, which is that if you would need to know more about the biomolecule, if you were trying to look at a 100 nanometer or a micron big biomolecule, you could see it with light that's bigger than a nanometer, so that answer is not inclusive enough. Yeah, and I actually also agree with the point that you made, um, so which, uh, which is the question of, well, what does light mean? The, uh, the semantics are ambiguous there. OK. so. Um, so the main point here, though, is that if you have a biomolecule of, depending on the size of your biomolecule, most of them are kind of small. So ATP synthase is an important biomolecule, which is about 10 nanometers long. And here I've drawn them to scale. This is ATP synthase. This is maybe what an atom looks like. This is actually just a single pixel on the screen. A real atom would be a little smaller than a single pixel on the screen uh, on this scale. And um, this is the uh, wavelength of 500 nanometer light, which would be bluish greenish light. So if you made this biomolecule blurry on that scale, it wouldn't be a very good imaging technique. Oh, by the way, the question you were asking earlier, is there 10 nanometer light? So let me rephrase that as, is there 10 nanometer electromagnetic radiation? And there definitely is. Um, and it's uh, something that Stanford is actually very good at. We make it up at Slack um, and use it specifically for imaging biomolecules. OK. So um, the nanoscale is the point where physics, chemistry, and biology all fuse because of this size scale. If you have something happening like you're measuring the transport properties of an individual molecule and seeing how, and using nanoscale electrodes to connect to it, and seeing how, the trans, how, seeing how the current through this molecule depends on whether the molecule is vibrating or not, and that's a biologically relevant molecule, it's a little bit hard to say, are you doing physics or chemistry or biology? So that's part of why uh, nanoscience is inherently interdisciplinary, because all of the disciplines basically meet at the nanoscale. So why would you say, so that's what nanoscience is. And I think you've already gotten a sense that things might be a little different at the nano. So let's flesh out some of the ways in which things are different at the nanoscale. Um, first of all, things that are smaller can be better. They can be better just because they're smaller. Size really does matter. Um, things that are smaller can be lighter. So clearly, if you're going in a jet and you can make every component of the jet lighter, that's better for all sorts of reasons. Um, they can be faster. Uh, for example, in electronics, if you have the same electronic process going on, but you just have a smaller component, your electron will get from one side of it to the other side faster. Um, they can be cheaper because it doesn't take nearly as much stuff to make. That's incredibly important for things like um, platinum, the use of platinum in catalysis. There's just not that much platinum in the world. And so it's very expensive to use. If you can use less of it to accomplish the same goal, that's much better. Um, and uh, smaller things can have less dissipation, and so they can use less energy. So those are ways in which just being smaller, even if the same physical processes are going on, can be better. But in addition to that, things are actually different at the nanoscale. Um, so at the nanoscale, things are atomistic. The nanoscale is not that much bigger than the size of an atom. So when you, things are at the nanoscale, you often can't help the fact that they're composed of individual atoms, as opposed to in our everyday life where we like to think of things as being continuous. Uh, they're also quantum mechanical. So things are um, wave-like uh, at the, cat <laughs> yes, cat-like. So um, for the aficionados among you, this is a cartoon of Schrodinger's cat, um, a famous pro paradox in quantum mechanics. And he's trapped inside a box, and he's scribbling wave equations on the inside, presumably trying to figure out himself for himself whether he's dead or alive. Um, but, 
The main point here is that things can be very probabilistic and also they can be very wave-like. And if anybody wants to see a movie of wave-particle duality from my quantum mechanics talk, I can show it to you afterwards. Um, also, things at the nanoscale tend to be much more random. So imagine that you want to make something a certain size. Let's take the example of the baseball. Modern machinists can easily machine things that are, whose diameter is accurate to less than a thousandth of an inch. So if you want to make a bunch of identical 10 centimeter spheres, you can do it to a very high degree of accuracy, relative accuracy. On the other hand, if you want to make a bunch of 10 nanometer spheres, the placement of every individual atom is essentially changing the size of the object. And so it's much more difficult to make objects of uniform sizes. That's just one example of the way in which randomness is important. Uh, the issue of temperature fluctuations is also very important. There's just, they're much more important. It, it, when you have a small object, a little bit of energy makes a much bigger difference. Um, a fourth reason is actually the ratio of surface area to volume. So if you imagine, so it's, you would think that, you might think that a sphere has the same ratio of surface area to volume, right? The volume, you know, you can calculate the area of the outside of a sphere and you can calculate the volume and it just depends on the radius. So you might not think it's that big of an effect, but it becomes an even bigger effect when you consider the number of the finite size of the individual atoms. Um, so here is the surface area to volume ratio um, as you're approaching the point where uh, things are the same size as individual atoms. So imagine that you have some clusters made of atoms. Um, and if you have a large cluster, uh, uh, only a small amount of it will be surface atoms. But if you have a small cluster, essentially all of the atoms are the surface. The whole thing becomes surface. This is actually one of the ways that um, the nanoscale can really make things useful. Because if you have something that you want to accomplish that requires surface area, um, like this is very important for batteries and for catalysis and for hydrogen storage, you can have more surface area with less stuff if you have a good nanostructure. Shell. Oh, uh, sorry. A shell is just the, um, yeah, I actually noticed that as I was doing it. Um, a shell is just how many atoms you have uh, going around in a circle. So imagine you just put like an atom in the center and then you put a shell that's one atomic layer thick around the outside, you have this. You put another shell that's another atomic layer thick around the outside, you have that, and so on and so forth. Just go out larger. Yeah, so it depends on the structure of the atom. So in this particular example, it's um, a crystal structure that results in the, the way that individual atoms bond to each other, for the, the example that was drawn here, um, leads to there being uh, uniform stacking planes at these kinds of angles, but it could be completely different for different atoms. Every crystal has its own way or one of a several classes of ways of how the atoms like to sit next to each other. So I could equally well have drawn this with um, cubes and the main point would have been the same. Okay. Um, so just to restate, the main point is that if you have a big thing, not that many atoms are on the surface because the surface layer will only be a small fraction of the total radius of your object. But if you have something that is of order a few atoms thick, then most of your atoms will be at or very close to the surface. So without worrying too much about the picture, that's the main point that I want to make there. OK. Um, nanostructure really makes things different even at the macro scale. So for ancient nanotechnologies, uh, some of the first nanotechnologists, this is a point made in an article in the New York Times by Chad Merkin um, from Northwestern. Uh, were actually in stained glass. So gold, the, the color that gold is actually depends on what size it is. And people who made stained glass really took advantage of that. And then these pictures in here show some modern examples where we're much better now at making um, little clusters of gold that are really pretty uniform in size and shape. So if you imagine that you keep cutting a piece of gold into smaller and smaller pieces, but bigger than nanoscale pieces, its color doesn't change. You have a brick of gold, cut it in half. Both halves are still gold. Um, but if you keep cutting, by the time you get to things that are, 12, uh, that are smaller than about 15 nanometers, the color of the gold actually changes. And this is, these are images of gold nanoparticles suspended in solution. And you can see that they're different colors. Um, this is true in other materials as well. These are, uh, this is a famous picture by Felice Frankel, who's an artist in residence at MIT. And this is a picture of cadmium selenide um, cadmium selenide uh, nanocrystals, sometimes called quantum dots. 
suspended insulation. And the fact that she was able to illuminate these vials with white light and get such purity of colors in the vials is an indication that most of the nanocrystals that are suspended in that solution are pretty similar in size. Okay. I'm going to skip over discussion of the nano facilities at Stanford and talk a little bit about some research towards applications in energy. Um, so solar energy is something that's very important to a lot of people. Um, we'd all like to have better utilization of solar energy. Um, one of the ways that nanotechnology is potentially helpful here is through the use of organic solar cells. So most solar cells now are silicon solar cells. They're, it's, they're expensive to produce. They have uh, limited efficiency. And if you want to make more efficient ones, they'd be even more expensive to produce. Organic or carbon-based compounds tend to be relatively inexpensive to produce, depending on the details of the compound. Um, and they also tend, in many cases, to be things that you can print. So the dream would be to be able to print solar cell materials using cheap organic precursors to make the material and print them in inexpensive, quant large quantities onto flexible sheets to install wherever you like. In doing that, there's a couple of tricks. And it turns out that in the organic material that you use, the nanostructure of the material is incredibly important. So when you have a, a, a photovoltaic, which converts solar energy into a voltage, um, you have a photon that comes in and interacts with the material. And the photon is absorbed. And it produces what we call an electron hole pair, which is that it produces an electron that has a higher energy than the electrons had previously. What you want to do is you want to get that produced electron out of the solar panel material before it has a chance to recombine and give up its energy as heat. The trick to doing that is probably to have nanostructured electrodes so that you can pull the electrons and the holes apart from each other as quickly as possible. And so there's tremendous effort on working with that nanostructure to try to accomplish this process. Um, there's also work on trying to um, harvest the thermal energy that's lost in photovoltaics. This is not a new idea. It's been known for a long time that some of the energy that comes in from the sun is lost to thermal energy, and that you could potentially um, harvest it if you could have a thermal engine attached to your photovoltaic cell. Um, What's new now is that uh, my colleagues, uh, have, led by Nick Malosh, have developed a way to actually make the solar cell function even more efficiently at high temperatures. Whereas usually the traditional uh, problem with ideas like this has been that solar cells function less efficiently at high temperatures, while heat engines function less efficiently at low temperatures. Um, another example is the desire to have transparent electrodes. So transparent electrodes are useful not only for energy, but also for information technology. But the idea is that you want the, the light from the sun, the photons, to be able to get in and hit the material that's going to produce the uh, current from your photovoltaic cell um, it, as efficiently as possible. You don't want them to be absorbed by whatever you've put there to carry the current away. Uh, and so there's a lot of work on transparent electrodes. The one on the left is an artist's conception of a carbon nanotube network. And the one on the right is a network of uh, silver nanowires. And both of these have been shown to have nearly the same performance as indium tenoxide. But carbon nanotubes, at least, are cheaper. And both of them are much more flexible. OK, energy storage is another thing that people would like to do much more efficiently. Um, one of the recent results from Stanford researchers from E. Schwe's group is the idea that you could use silicon nanowires as an anode material in batteries. So traditionally, in lithium batteries, what happens is that the lithium uh, needs to go into the silicon. Um, and when it does that, it needs to penetrate into the silicon en enough to get a, a reasonable effect. And it causes the silicon to expand. Um, and that's an inefficient process. And it also results in long-term strain and potentially damage to the silicon. By using nanowires, you can actually get a tenfold increase in energy storage density over uh, carbon. Um, there is really good strain relaxation in a nanowire, because if you imagine taking a chunk of uh, silicon and trying to make it bigger by having lithium in it, um, it, it's hard to make something bigger in the same space. But if you have a nanowire, it's no problem. They can all just expand. Um, also, having these one-dimensional chains 
gives you good um, electron transport uh, to get the current down to the thing that collects the current. Another area is in high efficiency fuel cells. So in fuel cells, you take hydrogen molecules or potentially in the future other fuels, um, and you want to convert them into electricity. And that's a process where this, um, the, the anode and the electrolyte and the cathode are very important in doing that efficiently. And by having a nanostructure in those materials, you can take advantage of having more surface area, and you can also take advantage of having different strain properties. And there's a lot of work showing that, for example, in platinum, the reactivity of platinum is increased through having more surface and through having more strain. So platinum, platinum is actually a great catalyst. Platinum is potentially really, really good for fuel cells. The only problem with platinum-based fuel cells is that platinum is so expensive. And so if you can use nanostructure to make the platinum more efficient, that could really make a big difference. Let me tell you a few uh, applications in medicine. Uh, we have a cancer, uh, Center for Cancer Nanotechnology Excellence here. Actually, I think it um, has a slightly new name now, but um, until recently, it's been called the Center for Cancer Nanotechnology Excellence, focused on therapy response. So the basic idea is that there are a number of groups of people where you'd, both the general public and cancer patients and also cancer survivors, where we'd really like to have better ways of uh, screening people for, you know, do they have cancer? Are they at risk of cancer? Um, what, what's their prognosis? What kind of therapy should they be given? How is their therapy going? Um, what's their risk of recurrence? You know, how is their maintenance therapy going? Um, and all of these things uh, can be greatly enhanced by the ability to detect small biomarkers, small concentrations of biomarkers in the blood or the ability to do better biopsy on the cancer patients. So the idea is that you take a group of patients where you have one of these questions um, and you either take their blood or you take a biopsy, and you need some machine that's going to screen it. Um, and then the people who have a lot of the blue diamond biomarkers in their blood, which schematically represents a particular type of biomolecule, get the blue pill. And the people who have the yellow hexagon biomarkers in their blood get the yellow pill. And there's probably still going to be some people that you don't know what kind of pill to give them. So you'd like to be able to do enhanced screening like this. And actually, people are really working on using nanoparticles for such screening. Um, so the idea is that you use magnetic nanoparticles to tag cancer is one idea. And another idea is that you can take blood samples and biosamples and use nanoparticles to uh, do a better job of detecting what kind of cancer it is. The way that works is this. Um, OK, let's see. Sorry. So you take a blood sample or a biopsy, um, and then you mix it with some kind of nanomagnet that's been tagged with some biomolecule that'll stick to the biomolecule that you're looking for. Individual biomolecules are hard to detect, but uh, my colleague Xian Wang, together with researchers at the Cancer Center for Nanotechnology Excellence, has been working on ways to um, detect nanomagnets extremely well um, and thereby detect the biomarkers that they can be programmed to stick to. Um, nanoparticles are also potentially useful for improved imaging in medicine. Um, these are a bunch of different types of nanostructures that you could imagine using. Uh, gold dots, which as I mentioned have different colors depending on what size they are, you can have biomolecules stuck to them. Um, you can have uh, iron cobalt and iron oxide, which are magnetic particles. You can have all kinds of different structures which can be designed on the one hand to provide contrast in some kind of known imaging technology, and on the other hand, can be functionalized so that they stick to whatever in the body it is that you're trying to detect. Um, and when you do that, you can greatly enhance imaging in optical modes. There's a lot of work using quantum dots for this kind of purpose. Um, and and uh, magnetic resonance imaging is something where magnetic particles can really make a big difference. OK. So um, I want to make sure that I leave time for questions. So let me say just a little bit more about uh, developing new tools and investigating matter at the nanoscale. So now we're moving more into my own area, which is on really uh, how do we see things at the nanoscale? What kind of things can we measure at the nanoscale? And, um, and uh, how, how do things change at the nanoscale? So in the beginning, a lot of this was motivated by information storage. So, and actually, you notice that I haven't told you about the information technology applications of nanotechnology. 
And that's because I think they're relatively familiar to most people. I don't think it comes as a surprise to any of you to learn that in your computer and in your iPhone, you have very, very, very small transistors um, and other components. That's why I haven't talked about information technology so much. But it's worth mentioning the beginning because the beginning of it was really the beginning of tool development in this area. So Richard Feynman gave a famous talk in 1959, 51 years ago. Uh, and his talk was called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. It included a $1,000 challenge to take the information on the page of a book and put it on an area that was 1 over 25,000 times smaller in linear scale. So that was in 1959. Um, and in 1985, Stanford graduate student Tom Newman actually claimed that prize by using an electron beam to engrave the opening page of A Tale of Two Cities. And here is a copy of an image from the actual paper. It was the best from the actual uh, scientific paper that they published. I don't think they had to check about copyright issues for using it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Um, and so that was in 1985. And today, as I showed you earlier, these tools are routine. We now have a fully modern e-beam writer that we purchased from a company, as well as a transmission electron microscope, as well as a different object called a nanoscale secondary ion mass spectrometer. And those are large tools that we use to focus beams to see and manipulate the nanoscale. But these large beam tools can't do something else that Feynman thought about. These large beam tools that we use all the time now can't manipulate individual atoms. Feynman, in his 1959 lecture, said, I'm not afraid to consider the final question as to whether, ultimately, in the great future, we can arrange atoms the way we want, the very atoms, all the way down. <laughs> so again, that was in 1959. And in 1986, a collaboration between Stanford and IBM researchers invented something called the atomic force uh, microscope, which was closely related to an early invention called the scanning tunneling microscope. And this is how those two images work, th those two devices work. Imagine that you have an array of atoms. Um, and you have some very sharp tip, so sharp that it just has a single atom on the end. Sus suspend for a moment your doubts about whether such a tip could actually be, be fabricated and be stable or not, which are very important questions. Um, if that tip interacts with the surface in some way, uh, that's very local, um, then you could imagine that the thing, whatever is measured by that tip, would change as it moves from atom to atom. The two things where that happens most dramatically to create modern tools are atomic force microscopy, where you actually measure the force between this atom and that atom by seeing how that force causes a silicon um, diving board to deflect, and scanning tunneling microscopy, where you pass a current that passes from this atom to that atom. And the amount of the current depends on whether this atom is over that atom or is between two neighboring atoms. So using modern imaging technologies, you can take data as you take this tip and scan it back and forth precisely over the surface. Since this work was initially done at IBM, you use an IBM computer. <laughs> Actually, today we use a lot of IBM computers still. Um, and so as you move over one row, you get a signal that looks like that. And then as you scan back and forth, you get more rows, and you plot them on your computer. And the early data actually looked like this. The early data was these long, wavy lines. In fact, some of the people who did this early work had the data coming out on chart recorders. And they took the huge rolls of chart recorder paper back to their home and laid it out on their front lawn and stood at a distance and looked to see a pattern of the structure of individual atoms on the surface like this. Of course, now it's all computer processed and usually been made three-dimensional as well. Um, OK, so you can use these things not only to image individual atoms, but if you have atoms that are sitting on a surface at low temperature, you can actually use these things to pull those individual atoms. And uh, my colleague, Professor Harry Minohran, is giving a talk tomorrow about um, a, a more quantum mechanical talk. And he'll talk a little bit about how you can assemble structures and study quantum mechanics in those structures. Um, so you don't want to miss that. And this is a famous picture when this work first started to be done from IBM, where they constructed a corral of individual atoms 
and used it to study the wave-like nature of the surface electrons inside the corral. So that was in 1993. And then more recently, it's actually been used to make the world's smallest writing. So this is an image of a copper 111 surface. And the Minoharan group here at Stanford took um, individual carbon monoxide molecules, and they put them on carefully chosen places in the surface in order to structure the electronic wave functions, for those of you who know some quantum mechanics, to structure the electronic wave functions inside this box to make shapes like S and U, depending on which energy levels you're looking at. So that's the world's smallest writing. Um, and Jay Leno had something to say about it. Okay, so I want to make sure that I leave enough time for questions, so I'm going to skip over the question of nanoscale magnetic resonance imaging and the observation um, in magnetic resonance imaging of individual viruses. And I'm also going to skip over my own work about manipulating quantum vortices and CFR conductors. And I'll um, close by telling you about uh, Gecko research. So um, Gecko research is very popular right now. Geckos, as you probably know, are amazing animals that have very, very sticky toes. They have very specially shaped toes. They have very special ways of moving their toes. And if you look very close at the toes of a gecko with an electron microscope, you see that the toes of a gecko have these little tiny, uh, tiny spatula shapes at the end of them. And it's these many, many, many spatula shapes at the end of a toe of a gecko that let it have its amazing mechanical properties. And so researchers here, I just sat on a thesis defense about this a few months ago, um, are working on, this isn't a sete from an actual gecko, they're working on trying to make nanostructures and microstructures that will let you um, imitate the gecko. And they've been having some success. Okay, <laughs> so to summarize why nanotechnology is important, um, modern tools give us an unprecedented ability to synthesize, manipulate, and characterize matter at the nanoscale. We've known it was important for a long time, but now we can really start making use of it and really start engineering it. And I hope by giving you a couple of examples, I've shown you the extent to which this is true in many, many different fields. Pretty much anything that you want to study that's you know, kind of not astrophysics, pretty much anything that you want to study on, on at Earth-like scales, by looking at it at the nanoscale, you can learn something special and new and different about it, and maybe manipulate it in a way that you couldn't otherwise. So there are dramatically different properties at the nanoscale, and it has an impact on every field of science and engineering. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd like to take questions. Let me play this movie again while I take questions. Yes? Have the organic uh, solar cells achieved the efficiency of silicon, best silicon solar cells? Um, no, I don't believe that they have, uh, but they hope that they will. Um, so there's a, so in, in terms of optimizing, uh, let me say a little bit about the nature of the challenge. So silicon is just one, is one kind of material, and silicon is a material that's relatively simple. Um, no, no, I don't mean any offense to my colleagues who study silicon. You know, it's, it's tremendously interesting material, but it's been really, really studied. There's been a huge worldwide societal investment in silicon. What are the properties of silicon? It has a relatively simple theory, um, and people are just really, really good at making it. Um, so, uh, so silicon solar cells are natural to do really well. 
Uh, they also have some properties that make them pretty good for, uh, for those kinds of applications. Um, when, you say, when we say organic materials, there's also been a lot of work in organic materials, but there are many, many, many different kinds and classes of organic materials. And it's only relatively recently that there's been a huge effort on studying organic semiconductors, both for the information technology industry and for the um, energy industry. Uh, and so there's just a lot of materials to look through and a lot of things that can be potentially optimized. So I know people who are pretty serious people that have set themselves the goal of making really competitive um, organic solar cells on relatively short, what are academically relatively short time scales. Um, so I'm not enough of an expert on solar cell materials to know the answer to that, but I think the answer is probably yes. And um, it depends on what you mean by better. If by better you mean more efficient, efficient, yes, yes. But there's a lot of other things besides that that go into uh, something being better. Uh, Professor Harris wants to comment on this question. Uh, the record efficiency is about 42%. No, no, they're multiple junction cells, what's called gallium arsenide and germanium and uh, gallium oxide. So the question was whether, uh, what's the best efficiency that's been achieved by non-organic materials other than silicon? And the answer was 42%. Right. So yes. They, they tend to then operate and, those under high <coughs> illumination using cheap optics. Focus the light down to like a thousand times the intensity. So that's how you work on the cost issue. Right. And so this statement was that focusing the light down also helps with the cost, uh, uh, the cost issue. And the, um, of course, you want, if you can focus the light, you can and still keep the efficiency of your solar cell the same with a thousand times more light shining on it. You can get a thousand times more energy for the same cost of the solar cell material itself. Um, and actually, the photon-enhanced thermionic emission that I showed you briefly when I was talking about solar energy actually makes use of that. Yes? So I guess I'm interested in the race to get the most efficient electric car with the longest time uh, distance to charge. Is driving with it for batteries for the longest time? Um, so the question was that the race to get the longest uh, travel in a car on, based on a battery is driving the battery industry, and nanotechnology is a key player in that, and is the US behind other countries, right? Um, so uh, the, the, the US certainly has uh, fewer commercial producers of uh, batteries than uh, other countries do. Um, and I think that the manufacturers who are in the race to um, be the people who have the best batteries in their cars, which is you alluded to is really what's driving electric cars to a large extent, it's not the only thing, but it's one of the things, uh, are basically in the game of testing and moder monitoring um, batteries from many different companies with many different models from each company. So there are these huge like battery lab um, places where they're just monitoring the batteries over many, many cycles. And yeah, most of them are, are not from US companies. I do think there have been huge advances from nanotechnology. And of course, the question is, you know, translating an academic advance into an uh, advance that you can actually put into a car um, is usually quite a long process, especially something like a battery where, uh, in a car where people's lives really depend on it, as well as their convenience. Um, and so, I think the US has really done a great job of coming up with innovations that are ripe for testing to make that transition to the marketplace. And the research that I showed was one example. Um, Ishui's work has led to a startup company that's working to further test and commercialize that technology. Um, but actually putting it in a car, that we'll all be hopeful. Yes, yes. Um, so the statement was that one of the slides that I showed uh, gave the example of using nanotechnology to do basically a biopsy to, to identify what there is 
um, in a cancer situation. And another possible application of nanoparticles in medical technology is actually using um, nanoparticles with some kind of tagging to deliver medicine or potentially some other form of therapy to a, a site where there's something that needs to be fixed. So um, one example of that would be using a nanoparticle that has some kind of binding material on it um, that's a shell that could have some medicine inside it to be delivered right where you want. Another example is magnetic nanoparticles, where you can take a magnetic nanoparticle and, again, tag them so they'll stick to some particular sites in the body or some particular kind of cell that you want to get rid of, like cancerous cells. And then once you have enough magnetic nanomagnets in the body, you could um, use external uh, radiation, not a scary kind of radiation, but just something as simple as a microwave, to have local heating and just kill the cancerous cells that way. And so the, those are things that people are working on. Um, the question of how close we are, if you asked me to give a futuristic vision, I'd say that you know, I know some pretty reliable people who hope that we'll be there in 10 years. So. Yes? Imaging the simplest atomic system, whatever that is believed to be today. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, what's the application of nanotechnology to the um, elucidation of, the, of, of imaging the simplest atomic system, whatever that's believed to be today? So I think the simplest atomic system would be hydrogen. So hydrogen is a single proton with a um, single electron traveling around it. And I think that um, nanotechnology actually, in terms of going in and trying to make direct images of that, probably hasn't really taken us as far as spectroscopy has in understanding the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom has been pretty well understood since around the time of the advent of quantum mechanics. And um, we've, we've known pretty well what it looked like and what its electron distributions were, because it's a relatively simple thing both to calculate and to measure and to compare theory to experiment um, for, for quite a while. We didn't, we didn't really need nanotechnology so much for that. Now, if you go back to examples like, um, if you go back to examples like, like this, the example of the, the scanning probe microscope, oops. Yeah. Okay, so if you go back to examples like this, like the scanning probe microscope, there have been some nice advances in scanning probe microscope in studying the structure of atoms on surfaces. So silicon is actually an example of a surface that people are really interested in. What happens is that if you have a whole crystal structure here, um, the surface of the crystal tends to look a little different than the rest of the crystal. The atoms don't sit in exactly the same place on the surface that they would if they were deeper in the material. That's called um, surface reconstruction. And recently, there have been advances in atomic force microscopy that let you have a particular atom on the tip of an atomic force microscope that has Real atoms don't, don't look spherical like this. Real atoms often have some shape to their electron orbitals. And so you can have one that has some orbital hanging out here, and you can use it to get in and, and image the individual atomic orbitals inside the atoms on the surface. So that, that's a pretty exciting technology for studying atomic structure. Yeah, but, but mostly atomic structure has been studied by really precise spectroscopy, looking at how light of different wavelengths interacts with the atom and then inferring what the structure of the atom must look like for it to interact in that way with light of those wavelengths. Is that far infrared? Is that the term far infrared spectroscopy you said? Oh, no, I just said spectroscopy. Yeah, it could be. In some cases, it's far infrared spectroscopy. In some cases, it's visible spectroscopy. It depends on the atom and what its structure is. In some cases, it's, it's other wavelength spectroscopy. Um, yes? So the question was, which application do I think is closest to real commercialization? And I would say that the information technology industry is already completely dominated by nanotechnology. Um, your, you know, your iPod, your computer, your cell phone, all of that is really real nanotechnology. Um, in terms of the other applications, there's a number of uh, cases where people are studying, let me see if I have that actually. People are studying um, materials with different properties. So I would say that nanostructured materials is probably the next biggest one, um, where there's really actually uh, genuine things that people are doing. So for example, um, 
Sunscreen is actually a nanotechnology. Sunscreen actually relies on the, in the nanostructure of things in order to give you good sunscreen properties. You know, there's paint whose uh, composition has been influenced by our understanding of nanotechnology. Um, there's uh, uh, ways that we can uh, mess with the nanostructure of material in order to give them particularly properties that we want in order to make them impervious to dirt or in order to make them really slick as you swim through, swim through the water. So that's another example where nanotechnology is really already there. Uh, so I, probably this is the last question. Yes. Um, I just had to ask, are those uh, socks there, the ones with the silver nanoparticles in them to, avoid, to, to uh, fight odor and bacterial growth? Um, yeah, I think they are. Actually, I, I don't. This is kind of a, a slide that I didn't put together. So I'm not sure what those socks are. In fact, that's why I didn't show it earlier. And I'm also not too sure exactly what the jacket is. But if you come up afterwards, I'll find out for you. The others are the things that I said. Yeah. OK, do I have one more question? Or um, yes, one more question. Yes? Are we studying the health and environmental risks associated with nanotechnology? These are really small things. I mean, we, we have some really bad experiences with really small things in the lungs and the blood. Yeah, so the question was, are we um, studying the health and associated risks of nanotechnology? And the answer is yes, the community as a whole definitely is. Um, there is a number of. Uh, research centers. So there's a number of industry situations where people look at particular nanotechnologies that they're hoping to commercialize. Obviously, companies want to be really careful about that. There are also academic units that specialize in that. There's a really good one at Rice. Um, there's also watchdog agencies. Um, the state of California has actually been really uh, proactive in this area. So the state of California has sent Stanford researchers a number of questions, quizzing us carefully about what nanotechnologies we use in the lab and what's the volume of them and you know what what you know are they in quantities that could potentially be dangerous and it's quite a lot of work because for every um, thing there's a different answer right like even if you say a carbon nanotube different carbon nanotubes have different kinds of carbon nanotubes have very different properties that could potentially be dangerous or not dangerous in very different ways so I mean asking is nanotechnology dangerous is a lot like asking is technology dangerous but the general point that nanotechnology could be dangerous in different ways than technology, than other forms of technology is something that people are really looking at. It's also important to remember, though, that you know, soot is, that, that most people are exposed to many more particles through just trace elements of soot in the air, um, even on a particularly clean day, than you know, most nanotechnology researchers get exposed to during much larger time, longer time scales. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you guys very much. Enjoy your weekend. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.